You can open your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3 this morning. Ruth chapter 3, it is the first scripture reading for our service today. It's a very appropriate reading for a communion Sunday as well. As we go through the four chapters of this little but very powerful book. And this morning we'll be focusing on redemption. Redemption. I'd like you to notice with me three things in this passage. Number one, the need for redemption. And we see that in verses one through nine. Number two, the response of the redeemer. And we see that in Boaz's response to Ruth when she goes to the threshing floor. And that's in verses 10 through 15. And then thirdly, the impact of redemption upon Ruth and Naomi in the final three verses, verses 16 through 18. So let's ask the Lord to bless our time together as we study the word of God this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. It always goes forth powerfully and never returns void. And so Lord, we ask this morning that you would bless our lives and that you would prepare us to take the bread and the wine But Lord, month after month, remind us of the great redemption you have offered to us in Jesus Christ. Bless our study now, we ask, Lord. May your spirit be our master teacher. We give you all the praise and the glory for what you will do. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll notice with me, first of all, the need for redemption. And we see this in verses 1 through 9. If you follow along in the first four verses, Naomi speaks to Ruth. And she, in essence, says these things. Number one, you need a husband. You need a home. You need to be established. Number two, Boaz is our relative. He's close in terms of family relations. He's also close in terms of geography. He's here. And he's also single. He's available. Number three, you need to go to him tonight. He'll be at the threshing floor sifting out his grain. And number four, make your need known to him by simply submitting to him and doing this ritual that Danny read about a little while ago, uncovering his feet and sitting at the foot of where he is sleeping. And so in verses five and six, Ruth obeys Naomi's instructions As always, it shows her respect and her love for her mother-in-law. Incidentally, this is a beautiful picture of family relationships. You know, we know how relationships are in the world as a result of sin. Most people don't get along real well with their mother-in-law. That's not the norm when it comes to the Bible. You hear people say sometimes, well, it's normal for children to rebel and do this, that, and the other. Many children do rebel, but that's not the norm. Too often we take the world's standards for human relationships and we make them our standards. Instead of looking in the scriptures and seeing what a biblical pattern of relationships looks like. At any rate, Ruth obeys Naomi's instructions and she goes to Boaz and in verses 8 and 9, she makes her need known to him. She states her need for a kinsman redeemer. Now remember, Naomi said, go and do this. She didn't say to say anything to him. She said simply, go through this ritual and he will tell you what to do. But you'll notice that Ruth personalizes this in verse 9. Boaz wakes up, he's startled. I can imagine being startled. If there was a young woman sitting at the edge of my bed or at the foot of my bed and uh, half my age and I woke up, that would be cause for concern. Well, Boaz is startled. And Ruth speaks. She doesn't just sit there. Look at verse 12. The Lord repay you. Or excuse me, Ruth goes, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. And what is she saying? Well, she, if you remember last week, she is quoting the very words that Boaz quoted to her in chapter 2, verse 12. 
You remember when Boaz was praising Ruth and he said, the Lord repay you for all your kindness that you've demonstrated to your mother-in-law, Naomi. He said, may the Lord God bless you and reward you, the God of Israel under whose wings you have sought refuge. Well, here's Ruth going back now in chapter three at the foot of the bed, which is essentially an ancient marriage proposal. She is saying, in essence, I am available. And you have a duty as a kinsman redeemer. Basically saying, throw the mantle over me. You know, this is not the first time this has happened. The Bible makes it clear that God uses this kind of act in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8, to describe his covenant relationship with his people Israel as a betrothed to him. See, the ancient law of Leverite marriage said when a brother dies, when a man dies in Israel, then his brother would come and take the widow to be his wife and raise up children so that the brother, the deceased brother's name would not cease in Israel. And so in summary, this portion of the passage communicates Ruth's need, Ruth's obedience to go to a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, according to Deuteronomy 25 and the Leverite marriage laws. And then thirdly, Ruth's confession of her need to the Redeemer. And see, it's a beautiful picture that applies to every human being. Let's get the then into the now. Ruth's earthly material need for a Redeemer, for a kinsman Redeemer, is a picture of our heavenly spiritual need for a redeemer. You see, Ruth had a need to get married, to have a family, to be sustained. Well, the greatest need of all, ladies and gentlemen, is not for us to find a marriage partner or a job or perhaps our career in life. Our greatest need is not for earthly material redemption. It is for heavenly, spiritual redemption. And this is a beautiful picture of it. Just like Ruth, we all need a redeemer, a savior. The Bible makes that clear in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin has made it necessary in our world for human beings to need a redeemer. We don't stand holy before God on our own. In fact, the Bible says that we have no righteousness to stand before a holy God. He must furnish for us what he demands. And just like Ruth, we all need that redeemer. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God gives eternal life as a gift. It's not something we could ever work for or pay for. It's not something we could ever merit. It's strictly a gift. And like Boaz, Christ is available and sufficient to save. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. In Acts 4, 12, the apostle said, there is no salvation in any other name besides that of the Lord Jesus. Well, just like Ruth went to Boaz, we must go to Christ. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And just as Ruth made her need known to Boaz, we must make our need known to Christ. That is, confess our sins and believe in him to redeem us. That's why Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be a Christian. You'll be forgiven. As Ruth trusted Boaz and submitted her life to him, we must trust Christ and submit our lives to him as Savior and Lord. That's why John's Gospel 5 verse 24 says, truly, truly, Jesus speaking, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. 
He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death unto life. You see, in summary, Ruth's need for redemption is really a beautiful portrait of our need for redemption. But not redemption in the sense of an earthly, temporary type like marriage, but eternal redemption. We need a savior. Well, notice secondly with me quickly the response of the redeemer. This picks up in verse 10. All that Boaz says to Ruth First of all, look at verse 10. Boaz welcomes Ruth with a blessing and praise. Now, this is rather unusual because remember, uh, Ruth was a Moabite woman. You can imagine the startle that uh, Boaz would have had when this foreign woman came in at night, at midnight, and sat down at the foot of his bed. Part of the reason for that is in the ancient world, whenever there was harvest time and there was a time for threshing, the grain at the threshing floor. This was a time for pagan religions to practice sexual immorality. It was like a big grand party. And that was pervasive amongst the Moabites and other foreigners. But instead of shunning her, he immediately welcomes her and he blesses her. Look at verse 10. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after younger men, whether poor or rich. He welcomes Ruth, he blesses her, and he praises her. Look at verse 11. Not only this, but Boaz comforts Ruth from her fears, and he compliments her. Look at verse 11. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. He gives her a basic pledge. I will be your kinsman redeemer. And he compliments her in Proverbs from 31.10, the godly woman. It's a crown to her husband. Well, Boaz offers this kind of compliment to Ruth. Not only that, but he promises and guarantees redemption. Look at verses 12 and 13. Now, this is very significant. He says, it's true that I'm a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he will not redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Boaz is adamant. He's flattered that this young woman has come to him. She's not run after every other man in the village. Indeed, she hasn't run after anybody. But this is in fulfillment of the will of God. And that women in that day needed a protector. They needed a home. They needed a life. Because in the ancient world, life was very difficult for women, especially single women. He acknowledges the closest relative's right to redeem. That is to say, he submits himself, Boaz, to the law of God. Deuteronomy 25 speaks of the law of Leverite marriage. And the beautiful thing about Boaz is he doesn't do an end around the law. His chief concern is not for himself, it's for Ruth. The law must be obeyed. And there is a relative who is closer than me, and if he'll redeem you, that's great. I mean, Boaz celebrates Ruth's redemption, but he says, if he won't, then know for sure that I will do it. He will redeem Ruth. It's a picture, ladies and gentlemen, once again. What keeps us from being redeemed on our own? The law. The Bible says the law is our tutor that leads us to Christ. And it must be negotiated. You can't do an end around the law. Why the Bible says, the soul that sins shall surely die. We all are born with a sin nature. And we start sinning from the time that we are in our earliest age. But that's why Jesus came. Jesus didn't do an end around the law. He kept it perfectly. And then he died on the cross, if that weren't enough, for all of our infractions against the law of God. 
So here you see Boaz as a man of integrity. He's always been a man of integrity, but all the more so when it comes to the law of God because he, ladies and gentlemen, is going to keep it. And that is a pale picture of the Lord Jesus, for he kept the law perfectly, not just this law, but every law that was written down in the old covenant. Boaz promises and guarantees redemption. And then verses 14 and 15, Boaz honors Ruth and provides for her. Look at verse 14. He tells, apparently whoever was there in the early hours, let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. She's, he's concerned about Ruth's honor. He doesn't want to disgrace her. And he sends her back with a generous provisions. Six portions of barley. Scholars tell us this was about 80 or 90 pounds of barley. That's why it says that he put it on her. He didn't hand it to her to carry. It was too much. He balanced it on her head probably, and she took that load back to Naomi. You already see where I'm going with this. The response of Boaz to Ruth's earthly material situation serves as a beautiful picture of Christ's response to our eternal spiritual situation. As Boaz welcomed and blessed Ruth, so also Christ welcomes and blesses all sinners who come to him. When I look at my sin and I see my need, I need to go to Jesus. That's why we read John 12 this morning. Christ said, if I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. Why is there a universal appeal for Jesus Christ unlike any other world leader? It's because he was God in the flesh. And there is something wooing and winsome about him. And part of that is just like Boaz, he welcomes sinners to himself. And he blesses them. As Boaz relieved Ruth's fears and spoke of her as a treasure to him, so also Christ relieves our fears and looks at us as a treasure, child of God. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, you also believe in me. Fear not. Jesus said that over and over in his ministry. Fear not. You don't have to fear when you bring yourself and your sin to Jesus. He's waiting to hear from you. As Boaz promised and guaranteed Ruth's redemption, so also Christ promises and guarantees our redemption. That's why Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That's what we mark and look at every time we take the elements of the Lord's Supper. We look back to Calvary, where Christ faced the curse that was owed to us because of all of our failure to obey the law. Christ obeyed it perfectly. And he died on the cross for all of our sin against the law. He became a curse and took our punishment. As Boaz bestowed honor and provisions on Ruth, so also Christ bestows honor and generous, generous provisions on all of his children. Second Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And I love what 1 Peter 2.10 says, For you once were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, folks, in summary, just like Ruth was honored and treasured and provided for by Jesus, that is, again, a earthly picture of a spiritual heavenly reality. Whenever you go to Christ... And you say, Lord, I want a relationship with you. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the grave and that you're alive right now at the right hand of God the Father. I believe all that. And I want to leave my sin with you. I want to trust you for you to forgive and take away my sins and give me the righteousness, your righteousness, that only you can give. I love the story of the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son when he went away and spent 
his father's inheritance in a foreign land. He finally came to his senses and he said, I'll go back and I'll just eat what the pigs eat at my father's place. I'll be a slave. I'll be a servant to him. And he was surprised because on his way back, his father was waiting for him. In fact, his father ran to meet him and said, kill the fatted calf, put a ring on his finger. That's God's love. That's God's reception. Whenever we come clean, whenever we're real and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need your redemption. I need my sin dealt with. I need a new heart. I want a new life. Christ promises to furnish that. Well, that's the response of the Redeemer. Notice finally the impact of redemption. Look at these beautiful verses in 16 and following. He goes back and we see the impact of Boaz's encounter with Ruth as a picture of Christ's encounter with us. I want you to notice four things quickly. Number one, there's undeniable change. Look at 16a. This is not really a good translation. Really what Naomi communicates is, who are you, my daughter? She comes back and scholars have been puzzled over this for a long time. She kind of scratches her head, even as Boaz did to Ruth. Who are you? What, what are you doing down here? Well, Naomi communicates the same thing. Who are you, my daughter? Naomi is wondering, has Boaz so changed you forever? You know, when you fulfill the will of God and you meet the right person, there's a glow, I think. Somehow, some way, the woman that left at dawn is not the woman who is returning, or the woman that left at night is not the same woman who's returning at dawn. She is changed. We can only speculate how, but this is a different woman. It's no wonder Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. New things have come. Whenever you submit to Christ and you trust him as your Lord and Savior, whatever's in the past, whatever's there that you're ashamed of is gone. He takes our sin as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more. There's undeniable change in this woman. She got a new heart. She has a new life. There's also a personal testimony. Look at 16b. Then she told her all that the man had done for her. Kind of reminds me of the woman at the well. She had an encounter with Christ. He forgave her of her sins. She came into communion with him, and then she ran back to the village to tell everyone in the village all that he had done for her, all that he knew about her, and how much he loves her. A personal testimony. That's one of our responsibilities to share Christ with somebody else. If we have a relationship with a living Christ, we want to share that. That's why Peter said, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's an undeniable change, a personal testimony. There's also immediate blessings. She holds out these six measures of barley, these 80 or 90 pounds of barley. And he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Incidentally, there's some good advice there. If you're going to date a young woman, be sure to date her mother-in-law too. Uh, take care of business. <laughs> Sends, uh, send, up, send back a gift. Now Ruth showed Naomi these measures of barley. And she made the words of Boaz known. You see, this barley, this tremendous amount of food was a pledge. I wonder if Ephesians 1, 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. There's immediate blessings. There's also hope for the future. You notice Naomi says, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest but we'll settle this matter today. We're going to read all about that in chapter 4. But she had to tell Ruth to wait, but not without hope. Both women know Boaz will fulfill his word. Nevertheless, there is an unknown factor in the closer relative. But either way, redemption has come to this house. Hope has replaced despair 
with regard to the future. That's why Paul said in Romans 5, 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. People often ask me, how was somebody saved in the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament? And I always say the same way. Those in the Old Testament look forward to the coming of the Christ and his crucifixion and resurrection. We have the privilege to look back on the cross. But either way, it's faith in God's Messiah. That's what salvation has always been about. And the Old Testament saints had the opportunity to wait for the coming of Messiah, but they were still redeemed by faith in this mysterious one who would come. We just have the privilege to look back. That's why Titus 2 says, we wait for the blessed hope because Christ is coming again. And we will see him visibly. He gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness. To put his Holy Spirit in our hearts and give us a sense of peace and contentment. Have you experienced that? Have you ever asked Christ to be your own personal redeemer? If you haven't, I challenge you this morning, very quietly and simply, to ask him to come into your heart and to start changing your life, to make himself real to you, and to engage in a relationship with him that will change the course of your future. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful book. And Lord, for this beautiful picture of redemption. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us would possess it. That we would take hold of that which is life indeed and trust in Jesus Christ alone as our personal Savior and Redeemer. Lord, do this all the more. And for those who have already embraced Christ, may we rehearse the gospel as we partake of the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Lord, do all these things and more. We'll give you praise and glory for your service to us and your sanctification of us. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 479. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 only of 479. Let's stand together. <clears throat> 